The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online.
Uh, good morning. For those of you in Washington, D.C. or the East Coast of the United States, uh, good evening. For those of you in other parts of the world who are tuning in to CSIS to join us for our very distinguished speaker. Um, I'm Michael Green. I'm Senior Vice President for Asia uh, and a professor at Georgetown University. And we're pleased to have joining us um, uh, once again to update us on the situation uh, with Tibet, uh, particularly in the context of growing tensions between China and virtually all of her neighbors, particularly around uh, the Himalayan mountains. Um, we are delighted to have with us the Sikyong, uh, the political head, elected political head of the Tibetan uh, Central Administration, um, Lopsang Sangte. He is a graduate of Delhi University with an LLB and a BA. Uh, he studied at Harvard University in the 1990s on a Fulbright and was the first Tibetan to receive an SJD uh, from Harvard Law School, where he developed an expertise in human rights law and international law. In 2011, he was elected uh, the Sikyong, uh, the civilian um, uh, democratically elected uh, leader of the Tibetan authority, uh, when His Holiness the Dalai Lama made the decision that as a democracy, it would not be appropriate for him to be both a spiritual and political head, as, as many of you would know on this webinar. I and mean, then in 2016, he was re-elected. Um, we're going to hear from uh, the Sikyong, uh, and then I'll have a few questions for him, and then we'll open up to your questions. You can send them to us uh, by looking on the uh, website where you logged in for this. There will be a button you can click to send the questions. We'll get to them as many as get to as many as we as we can in the time uh, we have ahead of us. So uh, thank you for joining us once again. It's a great honor and it's a great privilege. We look forward to your remarks. Oh, thank you, Michael, for uh, the privilege and, uh, you know, good to see you again, this time uh, virtually, all the way from India to Washington, D.C., and you hosted me last time uh, to talk about religious freedom reincarnation. So today I'm asked to talk about uh, the geopolitical significance of Tibet in the context of India, China, and the U.S. Uh, first, uh, let me quote you what you said in 2018. China's insecurity about this region is deeply rooted. In 2008, China's Central Military Commission ranked Tibet as the most critical sovereignty challenge ahead of Xinjiang and Taiwan. So it could have changed a bit, but clearly, um, as you said, you know, Tibet ranks very high in the geopolitical context. So also what Mao Zedong said in uh, 1940s and 50s that he said, I'm quoting him, he who holds Tibet dominates the Himalayan Piedmont. He who dominates the Himalayan Piedmont threatens the Indian subcontinent and he who threatens the Indian subcontinent may well have all of South Asia within his reach and with that, all of Asia. And then in the recent you know, uh, tragic incident at Galwan Valley at the border of India and Tibet, now Chinese army has moved in. Um, obviously there's a lot of talk in India as to why the Chinese army are intruding uh, into Indian territory and uh, pressing uh, you know, the Indian army. And also in 2014 at Doklam uh, on the side of Bhutan, but bordering both India and, you know, and obviously the Indian state of Sikkim. Uh, so all this has raised this issue. And uh, I quoted again Mao Zedong, uh, which has become, you know, which is much quoted in Indian news, news media, where Mao Zedong said that Tibet, Tibetan plateau is the palm. We have to occupy the palm. And the five fingers are Ladakh, Nepal, Sikkim, Bhutan, Arunachal Pradesh, right? So in recent years, there's border incursions and all these five fingers uh, is also clearly alarming the Indian subcontinent and South Asia as to why uh, China is so press on, you know, uh, making these inroads and intrusion. And in the last 40 years, there was a violence too. I think 20 or Indian soldiers were killed and more than 100 injured, right, for the first time. So hence, why all these things are happening um, is the question. Now, then let me go uh, to U.S. relationship with Tibet. Then I'll give you the historical context and make you understand how it has been and you know, why we are back to square one. That is, 
1943, uh, Franklin Roosevelt wanted uh, to send supplies to its ally Kuomintang government and uh, wanted a you know, route to send the armed supplies uh, to Kuomintang through Tibet. And we know he famously sent a watch uh, and a letter and uh, his solemnness there, I'm still has the watch and each time he comes to GC, he shows the watch uh, you know, given to him by Franklin Roosevelt because he was more interested in the watch than the letter and the content of the letter, you know. So at that time to demonstrate Tibet's independence, uh, we refused to uh, give the pass uh, for you know uh, Americans to uh, supply uh, you know uh, uh, to uh, Kuomintang government. Now um, uh, and that's that. And then in uh, uh, 1959, after the occupation of Tibet, when Indian Chinese army moved in, obviously Eisenhower was the president, right? So being from a military, he was very interested in the, you know, the mountain terrain of, uh, of Tibet, but especially the skip route uh, from Tibet to India. So he essentially, uh, His Holiness Dalam essentially disappeared from March 17th to 30th of March, but it was Eisenhower who knew every, uh, you know, pass and the mountain that His Holiness Dalam was crossing because CIA had trained two Tibetan, four Tibetans, and two of which, uh, two of them accompanied His Holiness, and they were sending messages to Washington, D.C. So each, each morning when Eisenhower comes to his office, you know, he says, where is the Lama? And he puts a pin, you know, wherever that mountain route is. So he was closely following. And as his holiness, the Lama was entering India, he called Pandit Nehru to give uh, refuge. And Pandit Nehru had already also had uh, uh, known about his holiness escape towards India. So uh, he agreed. Then, uh, you know, his solemnness wrote to John F. Uh, uh, Kennedy for the support in 1960, and President Kennedy replied, even though he was, uh, he has not taken oath, but uh, without the uh, letterhead, he wrote, Tibet will one day be governed in accordance with the manifest wishes of the Tibetan people, so in 1961. Then, uh, in 19, uh, 1959, 60, 65, you know, three resolutions passed at the UN General Assembly, and one supported the self-determination of the Tibetan people. And we all know uh, later, you know, RF Kennedy Human Rights Award was also given to Solis in 1998. Now the critical uh, phase was that all this time, uh, you know, uh, the American government attitude towards and the policy towards uh, uh, China was more competition and, uh, uh, but uh, now in 1970s, President Nixon came and we know the famous trip of Kissinger and later Nixon to China that changed everything. So till that time, even America through CIA was supporting, uh, uh, you know, a Tibetan gorilla, but it ended abruptly. And uh, I think the Nixon Kissinger, uh, as per the policy of engagement and cooperation with China, I think Tibet became one of the first uh, major victim. And then it was uh, President Jimmy Carter in 1979 allowed His Holiness the Dalai Lama to visit uh, uh, America. And there was his first visit. And then President, uh, then we uh, come to George Bush, the father, after uh, Tiananmen Square tragedy, uh, he met His Holiness the Dalai Lama for the first time in the White House, allowed 1000 Tibetans to come and provide you know, Fulbright scholarship to Tibetans. Then uh, President Bill Clinton, I think, you know, met his holiness at the live press conference. He told uh, Cheng Zemin in Beijing, he said that he has met Dalai Lama and he likes him and proposed that Cheng Zemin also meet his holiness, he will like him too. And then came George W. Bush, uh, they became good friends. There were policy differences, but uh, they became uh, good friends and he attended the Congress of Gold Medal Ceremony and welcomed his holiness, the uh, Dalai Lama and pushed very hard for the Chinese government to engage in dialogue, substantive dialogue, to resolve the issue of Tibet peacefully. Then President Obama met his Solomon's dilemma four times. And for the first time, White House issued a statement supporting and applauding the middle way approach envisioned by his Solomon's dilemma. Now uh, we are with President Trump. Unfortunately, his Solomon's only made one trip uh, to America. And then even during that trip, he could not uh, uh, or did not go to Washington DC. So there was no 
meeting between the president, uh, but uh, President Trump uh, recently did wish his solemnness on his 85th birthday uh, in a uh, written letter. Uh, but under President Trump, a reciprocal access to Tibet Act was passed. He signed it. President, Vice President Mike Pence and Executive State uh, Mike Pompeo were very strong uh, on the issue of Tibet. And the ambassador at large, uh, Sam you know, uh, Brownback, visited uh, uh, Dharamsala and uh, you know gave very strong speech on uh, you know religious freedom and on the issue of reincarnation. So recently, now the House of Representatives have passed the Tibet Policy and Support Act, but now it's with the Senate and through this you know. Um, Forum, I urge the uh, Senate to pass the bill as well. And during this administration, the direct funding to Tibetan administration was provided. So throughout uh, the uh, American history, I mean, since 1940s, all the presidents have done something or the other for uh, Tibet issue. Now, uh, I think we're shifting away from President Nixon Kissinger uh, approach of, you know, engagement and cooperation with China, bringing them to the international community, making them more liberal, more democratic, respectful of human rights, uh, I think has given way to more realistic uh, approach that we must compete with uh, uh, China because you know China is an ideological challenge uh, to America and Western values. So I said in 2018 um, that either you transform China or China will transform you. And recently, you know, I heard uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo saying something similar, either you change China or China will change you. Uh, in 2017, when I uh, visited, uh, you know, European countries, you know, I say I opened my remark by saying, today I'm here not to seek your support to save Tibet. I'm here to warn you to save yourselves, you know. Uh, so I think this is the ideological challenge that the whole world is facing, the, the liberal values, the democracy, human rights, because China is restructuring the United Nations. If you look at some of the UN agencies, seven or eight of them have the senior most or the second senior most personnel are Chinese government appointees, you know, holding enormous influence. So this is where we are. They are trying to redefine human rights. So this is the challenge we are. Uh, so this is the major challenge, and you know Tibet uh, is the test, is the litmus test. So if you support Tibet, then you are for democracy and human rights. If you don't support Tibet, you are not for human rights and Tibet. You know, so this whole idea of cooperation, the Nixon Kissinger uh, policy that you can have a, what we call token gesture towards Tibetan people, and where and where while you fully engage with China uh, for your own benefit, I think is proven wrong. Now, on the India's front also, um, you know, India went through the same thing. Pandit Nehru uh, was assured uh, there was a gentleman agreement that if India agrees with the occupation of Tibet uh, and uh, China will respect India's influence in the Himalayan region, you know. Um, and then in uh, 1954, uh, the Solonists went to China in 1956. Uh, he came to India. And during that time, uh, Chinese Prime Minister Chao Enlai visited India two or three times, persuading his Solonist Dalai Lama or persuading through the Indian government uh, for his Solonist Dalai Lama to return uh, to Tibet. And he did return. The understanding was that genuine autonomy will be given to Tibetan people. And uh, you know there will be a peaceful, quote unquote, peaceful liber liberation. There will be no violence at all. Uh, unfortunately, and Nehru believed that, and uh, uh, he agreed. Um, but then, right after the occupation of Tibet was very violent. Now we know from March of 1959 to October of 1960, 87,000 Tibetans were uh, uh, killed, um, and then. Right after the 1962 war, you know, where India felt very betrayed, Nehru felt very betrayed, and then only prime minister who stood up uh, to China was Lal Bahadur Shastri, you know. Uh, he, in fact, said, we will recognize Tibetan government exile. And in 1965, India, for the first time, spoke in support of the United Nations resolution at the uh, General Assembly. And, uh, uh, you know, that's the only time of the three resolutions, 59, 62, and 65, 
the 1965 resolution, India also supported. But since Lal Bahadur Shastri, unfortunately, he died very soon thereafter, and all the prime ministers also resort to engagement with China, cooperation with China, thinking that friendly relationship with China will give them uh, some dividends and they will respect the India's dominance or influence over the Himalayan region. Uh, so you can go uh, to um, Rajiv Gandhi when he was the prime minister in 1988, 89, 88 visit. Um, you know, he tried his best. And, and finally, during the Narasimha Rao, Prime Minister Narasimha Rao time, LAC was more or less agreed upon, you know, line of actual control. But then in 2003, Atal Bahir Bajpai, you know, BJP Prime Minister, who was a true and great friend of Tibet since 1950s, okay? But when he actually became the Prime Minister, he was the first one to acknowledge Tibet is part of China, thinking that uh, China will give this uh, concession. So in 1950s, Pandit Nehru had gentleman agreement, but what China got was in writing that Tibet is part of China. Similarly, in 2003, Atal Bahir Bajpayee also and previous prime ministers, they all got some assurance, but in writing, China got what it wanted. Tibet is part of China. Now, after 2003, once they got that, the border inc incursion increased rapidly. And then, now, all the way till now, cooperation uh, was the and a key word uh, with China. And unfortunately, what, as I said at the very beginning, the Mao Zedong said, you know, if you control the Himalayas, you can control, if you control Tibet, you can control Himalayas, then you can control the whole of South Asia and Asia is being realized, it's being implemented. And similarly, Tibet as the palm going after five fingers, you know, including in Sikkim, Nepal, Bhutan, Arunachal, and Ladakh, you can clearly see this. So point I'm trying to make is in the last 60 years, Chinese policy has not changed. Occupy Tibet and extend your influence to, you know, South Asia and whole of Asia. And let me conclude by saying, Xi Jinping recently said, Stability and security of China is dependent on stability and security of Tibet. Now, to strengthen, stabilize, and you know, securitize China, you must you know, strengthen the border of Tibet. So what Mao Zedong said in the 50s, occupation of Tibet, and what Xi Jinping is saying now, clearly indicate that Tibet is very, very important in geopolitical context. Now, without finding a solution to the Tibet issue, you cannot have peace in the Asian region. You know, India and China has 37% of the world population, but they have only you know, around 10% of fresh water, right? So already Tibet has the water tower of Asia, all the major rivers. Brahmaputra is a lifeline for you know, uh, northeast of India and Mekong is a lifeline for Southeast Asia, Yangtze River, you know, Indus River for Pakistan. Um, all that is brought to, uh, you know, I know it's, it's, uh, it's in front of us. And Tibet as, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's rich in natural resources, hundreds of billions of dollars worth of natural resources are there. Uh, all this exploited and militarization of Tibet, right? So essentially the Chinese government has decided we will militarize Tibet, suppress Tibetan people and assimilate Tibetans, not just you know, diluting and discouraging Tibetan language and Tibetan religion, but also right, sinicizing Buddhism now. They want Buddhism to be taught in Chinese language. This is how you control Tibet and this is how you control the Himalayan belt this is how you control Asia. So their policy has been consistent. And unfortunately, you know, all the neighboring countries, even America was taken for a right. Now, fortunately, in the last year or two, there is an awareness and so everybody's waking up and realizing that, well, Tibet as a buffer zone uh, separated China and India, and there was peace and stability. Now, without Tibet as a buffer zone, and you know, uh, there are tension and continues to tension as we speak. Thirty thousand from Indian side and thirty thousand from Chinese side uh, military personnel facing each other in Ladakh area. You know, 
So hence, Tibet is the key in finding solution in Asia. And that's why, as His Holiness Dalai proposed, that Tibet be made a zone of peace becomes you know, very relevant uh, today. Uh, so I want to end here by saying Tibet is a major issue in the geopolitical context of India, China, and America. Thank you very much for, uh, you know, to CSIS for giving me this opportunity. And uh, uh, good to see you, Michael. And uh, we all should remember, you know, we have this virtual meeting mainly because of Wuhan originated virus. Thank you. Um, uh, Sikyong, thank you. You gave us a very rich um, geopolitical history and spiritual and even environmental history. Um, and it's really quite, uh, intriguing uh, to hear about President Eisenhower tracking the uh, movements of His Holiness through the passes in the Himalayan mountains on a map in the Oval Office. He also tracked um, the security of the first island chain in the Western Pacific. All of this geography is now coming back in importance, mm -hmm. and in particular, as you point out, uh, the Himalayan plateau. Um, we're still collecting a number of very good questions for you, but let me um, begin the discussion. Um, you know, what you described and what we're seeing, the um, uh, repression in Xinjiang, uh, in Tibet, of course, uh, but also more broadly in Hong Kong, um, in Inner Mongolia. Um, His Holiness and your government have, in a very persistent and diplomatic and determined way, stuck to the so-called middle way. You know, neither independence nor complete um, surrender of Tibet's cultural and economic autonomy to China. I imagine there must be more and more questions about um, the middle way as uh, China cracks down, not only on Tibetans, but around the world. Um, and there's an election next year, of course, in your government. Um, what is your sense of the Tibetan people's views now of the middle way, of His Holiness uh, vision for how Tibet achieves what is best for the Tibetan people? Is it under debate and stress now, or, or, or how do you see it? The younger generation, the youth groups and other groups, the student groups, you know, because you are young, you are passionate, you know, and uh, uh, you advocate for independence of Tibet. And what they say, historically, Tibet was an independent country, and it's true. And we deserve and we are entitled to have independence. So yes, they have historical basis and uh, international law to back them up. But middle way approach came about based on reality you know, or reality of geopolitics. Uh, for example, three resolutions passed in the uh, United Nations General Assembly in 1960s. Okay, China was not even a member. Three resolutions were passed and at best, uh, the countries could come and support self-determination for the Tibetan people. In all the three resolutions, they did not mention China. This is self-determination for the Tibetan people but not even, in, uh, you know, they did not mention China. Now, America cannot support independence of Tibet because of one China policy and India and other countries the same. And let's look at Taiwan. In recently, Ch Taiwan is getting a lot of attention and upgrade in the embassy and relationship and visits. But because China says Taiwan wants to separate from America, President of Taiwan, Tsai Ing-wen, cannot visit Washington DC or Brussels or even Delhi, right? And so a middle way approach and it came about based on you know, reality of real politic and also reality of Tibetans capacity. We are 6 million Tibetans and there are you know, 1.4 billion Chinese. For every two Tibetans, there, there is one PL soldiers with automatic machine guns, right? All that. And also, this is based on Buddhist principles of, you know, win-win proposition, accommodation. So China says sovereignty and territorial integrity cannot be compromised. And His Holiness Dalai Lama says, okay, if I agree to two of your most critical, you know, conditions, then agree with mine. Stop repressing Tibetan people and give them genuine autonomy within the framework of the Chinese constitution and within China so that Tibetan identity can be preserved, Tibetan culture can thrive, Tibetan civilization can thrive, and they have basic freedom. So, you know, so these are the reasons why, you know, we have four middle way approach. And you're right, in the next uh, uh, election, 
uh, this uh, issue will come up. Uh, but middle way, as envisioned by Solonis Dalai Lama, is both spiritual, it's a win-win proposition, it's a compromise, but also based on, you know, reality of real politique. I like, uh, I like your line uh, that for every Tibetan, there are two PLA soldiers with a gun. But also, of course, for every Tibetan, there are 200 Chinese citizens who may decide and in many cases are deciding that the path to happiness uh, and spiritual enlightenment is Buddhism, not the Chinese Communist Party. So um, in a way, Tibet has a trump card <laughs> yeah. um, that probably frightens um, Zheng Danghai quite a bit. I had a follow-up question, uh, which I think I'll um, uh, present to you now. One of the tricky things always in negotiations uh, between His Holiness or, or now your government and Beijing is the question of um, who is in Tibet. <clears throat> I mean, the, 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 the middle way, as I understand it, um, is meant to be consistent with the Chinese constitution. In other words, not seeking uh, an independent state in, under uh, the United Nations. Um, but there are many devout followers of his holiness in Gansu, in, si in Sichuan, in Yunnan, in Inner Mongolia. Um, and um, so one of the sticking points has always been, how do you define Tibet? Um, is it where there are Tibetan people who are, are followers of his holiness? Is it the Tibet autonomous region? Um, this has always been tricky in the negotiations. And I wonder if you can help um, our audience understand your thinking on it? Well, I think the definition of Tibet is straightforward, I think, you know, because uh, even if you go by the Chinese definition, so there is Tibet Autonomous Region, which is essentially central Tibet, right? And then there are Tibetan prefectures and Tibetan counties as per the Chinese laws. So Tibetan prefectures and counties in Sichuan, Yunnan, Kansu, and Qinghai provinces so Chinese government, you know, itself defined them as Tibetan prefectures and counties where Tibetans are majority mainly. And that's, that is the definition of Tibet for us. So if you look at the ethnic map of China, the, our definition of Tibet overlaps directly with the ethnic component of Tibetan people, you know, where they live. Um, so this is how we define. And then, uh, if you just say Tibet autonomous region is Tibet, then His Holiness Dalai Lama is not a Tibetan because his family comes from, he himself comes from Qinghai, you know? And my father was from Sichuan, right? So then I'm, uh, I'm not a Tibetan. His Holiness Dalai Lama is not a Tibetan, right? So if you go by the demographic survey of China, so they have, you know, uh, calculated all these Tibetans as one nationality. And since 2008, each year they have a working group meeting. So recently, President Xi Jinping addressed the seventh work group, meet, uh, work group forum of Tibet. And who were the representatives? Officials from Tibet Autonomous Region and Tibetan prefectures and counties of Qinghai, Gansu, uh, Sichuan, and Yunnan. So yes, um, so we both agree, Chinese government, and we agree, uh, you know, what is Tibet? Um, thank you. That was a very clear answer. And um, let me ask about the Tibet Policy and Support Act, which um, still has to um, pass through the entire Congress. Can you tell us what uh, that act does for the people of Tibet that matters? And how should it be implemented uh, by a Biden administration or a second Trump administration uh, if, if it does pass? Yeah, we already have Tibet Policy Act of 2002. So in this Tibet Policy and Support Act, you know, there's a lot of improvement amendments and additions. So this is more comprehensive. So Tibet Policy Act has, was mainly about Tibet and human rights situation inside Tibet and support for uh, the Tibetan people inside Tibet. So Tibet Policy and Support Act has an environmental component religious freedom and reincarnation component and democracy and Tibetan administration. Um, so all these are added to this. So this is very comprehensive. So we are very happy that the US House passed it overwhelmingly, but now it's with the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. 
And I hope in the coming weeks in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee will pass it and take it to the floor of the Senate. So we are we were very uh, you know gratified to see the Hong Kong bill was passed and signed by President Trump. The Uyghur bill was signed and signed by you know uh, President Trump. And you know uh, it has to be Tibet Policy Act. So this is uh, the policy uh, of the American government on political front, environmental, democracy, you know human rights and also uh, funding for the Tibetan diaspora in exile and also inside Tibet. We recently finished a survey at CSIS of the American public and also about 500 thought leaders in different sectors of the economy and civil society about China policy. And um, a very solid majority of the thought leaders support um, targeted sanctions and other steps uh, that are in this bill. And interestingly, a significant majority of the business community uh, supports this. And we'll be presenting this uh, full report in a few weeks, but um, uh, the data shows that um, uh, not only the human rights community, but the business community is increasingly recognizing that we have to take some of the steps uh, such as the Global Magnitsky Act to um, deter Beijing from uh, continuing on this path of repressing basic freedoms on uh, not just religious freedoms, but basic human rights in Tibet. I have, um, most of the questions are coming to us over the website, but we have um, on the panel with us virtually, my colleague, Amy Lair, who's been doing uh, detailed research on Xinjiang in particular and beginning to track Tibet. So I'm gonna ask Amy to turn her mic on and ask you the next question. Thanks so much, Mike. Um, well, I just wanted to ask a question, I guess, around Chinese policy towards ethnic minorities. We've been looking at Xinjiang, where obviously there's mass detention, as well as trends of forced labor as a means of transforming culture. Um, and there's been recent reports about similar work programs in Tibet. Uh, and there's also unrest in Inner Mongolia. So I was wondering if you could just paint some uh, kind of a broad picture for us in terms of where you see Chinese policy towards ethnic minorities moving? And, and are there similar lessons learned for the major minority groups? Um, yes, you know, I have participated and organized in several meetings uh, with our Uyghur friends and Mongolian friends and, you know, and Tibetans. So essentially, if you close your eyes and listen to all our brothers and sisters, the narrative is essentially the same. You know, the occupation, invasion, suppression, cultural revolution, post-cultural revolution, things like that. And yes, uh, the Chinese government approach is you know, three-pronged approach. Assimilate, right, through destruction of monasteries and mosques, and you know, dilution of Tibetan culture, language, and uh, make them learn. Uh, in, for example, Chinese is the medium instruction at the high school, university level, even at the middle school level. Um, then, you know, synthesize everything. So even the Buddhism is sinicized, uh, mosques are destroyed, right? Islam is sinicized. Now you can't practice Ramadan, you can't keep beard, and you can't name you know, your children, you know, uh, Muhammad and other things. And other is to uh, suppress. So technologically, uh, manually, and then that's how the concentration camp uh, or the, you know, uh, uh, the vocational training of more than 1 million Uyghurs, you know, reported by Adrian Zen, <clears throat> Um, it's being much publicized, much discussed. Now, same author, Adrian Zen, has come out with a report saying in Tibet Autonomous Region, also half a million Tibetans are sent to labor camps with the military kind of drill uh, to what they call educate and give skills to surplus laborers from nomadic and farming areas, right? Now, <clears throat> uh, I, I, the condition is they must give up their land, you know, farmland and nomadic land to the government cooperatives and the youth will move to urban setting where they're given skills. After giving skills, you're on your own, you know. So this is how you suppress them. And then, you know, you are controlled. You are given, a, you know, what they call uh, ID card with very advanced SIM card, which will track you every movement. And they uh, develop this algorithm to track your movement and control villages and nomadic areas. So, and the third approach is they call it quote unquote development, building roads and railway lines and buses, things like that. But then this bring more Chinese. Uh, now 
you know, some say 60% of you know, Xinjiang or East Turkestan is Chinese. Similarly, if you go to Tibet, the urban areas are increasingly Chinese. Thankfully, 80% of Tibetan people live in you know, rural areas or nomadic areas, and Tibetans are still majority. Now in winter, Tibet is you know, 4,000 meters high and very cold. All the majority of Han Chinese go back to China. So in winter, Tibet is Tibetan majority, even in urban settings, right? So yes, this assimilation drive, the repression and quote unquote development to bring in more Chinese uh, is an age old uh, you know, practice. So that's why, you know, 154 Tibetans committed self-immolation. They burn, burn themselves in protest. Similar protests are taking place in Xinjiang. And recently, even the Mongolians uh, are organizing, you know, protests, you know, for their cultural rights and linguistic rights. So yes, uh, minorities have been repressed for all these years and protests and resentment is very strong in China, in Tibet, in Xinjiang, East Turkestan, and also in, in the Mongolia. Let me ask uh, more about that. Um, you, you, in your history, your fascinating uh, history of the Himalayan Plateau and the Tibetan question in US-China-India relations, um, you suggested that um, the policy we're seeing today um, from Beijing is essentially the same policy it was in the time of Mao Zedong. It's just more um, apparent or it's less camouflaged. And there is something of a debate now in the United States and other countries about um, the nature of Chinese um, hegemonic ambitions, repression at home, repression uh, and um, coercion against neighbors. And uh, I think uh, one uh, viewpoint, perhaps represented by Secretary of State Pompeo, is similar to what you said, which is this is the same China as Mao. It's a Leninist party. They're doing what they're doing because they can. There's another viewpoint, which is that a lot of this is about Xi Jinping, that she himself is um, uh, particularly uh, adamant about squelching any dissent, that he came out of um, the um, Cultural Revolution uh, fearing chaos, not like many of his cohorts, fearing cults of personality and social mobilization, that it, it's very much about Xi Jinping. And it seems to me that's an important question because I think for Tibetans, there has to be a theory of the case. How do we achieve change? How do we achieve positive change? And how do we get China to change its policies? And, um, you know, when I worked in the White House for President Bush, there was some hope uh, and some evidence that there was sympathy for Tibet within even the Chinese leadership, that there were questions about whether the Chinese model could work without greater religious freedom and so on and so forth. So um, could you, expand a bit on your um, uh, hypothesis about the nature of China's policies and your theory about how the international community can achieve change or convince China to take a better approach towards Tibet. I think, you know, uh, whether it's Xi Jinping's uh, you know, personal mindset or psychology or not, but I think it's a fact that he wants to be like Mao Zedong, so that's what Xi Jinping thought, is uh, put in the constitution at par with Mao Zedong, Deng Xiaoping's thought, right? So, and obviously uh, all the actions that he has taken place uh, clearly demonstrate that. And he's clearly flexing his muscle in the Indian subcontinent, in South China Sea and East China Sea. And, uh, you know, uh, acting with impunity uh, when it comes to Hong Kong too. And they're putting a lot of pressure on Taiwan as well. Uh, so clearly, um, I think he thinks time has come and he'll flex his muscle. And socialism with Chinese characteristic is, you know, uh, is the ideology, is the platform um, that he has given the world to choose. You want to choose democracy on the one hand or socialism with Chinese characteristic, right? So he's clearly giving a choice. And then he's coming out with alternative financial system and alternative currency, you know, influence the United Nation and uh, putting their own people at World Economic Forum. Uh, for example, the former foreign minister of Norway, he was very close to uh, China and, uh, you know, he uh, did stop talking about Tibet and, you know, he downgraded, we saw in his visit to China, he did all that. He was for engagement and now he's, you know, so every international forum that you look, 
and Chinese government or Chinese leaders, including Xi Jinping, are putting their people uh, uh, in places. Uh, so hence, you know, choice is very simple. Either you transform China or China will transform you. So hence, allies of democracies, you know, all the democratic practicing countries should come together and see it as a challenge, if not crisis. That choice is given now, either you uphold, stand on it and press Chinese government to change. So what we are saying is we are not saying, you know, uh, you should count out. What we're saying is you play by the rules, which is agreed by the international community. So many countries have agreed to these rules, which benefit every, everybody, right? So you come and become a responsible member of the international community, we'll respect you. So if you don't respect, you know, human rights of the Tibetan people, we can't respect you. Yes, you want to be superpower, but you can, you know, uh, through uh, military wise, but to be a genuine superpower, you must earn the respect. And only way you can gain respect is by respecting Tibetan people and Uyghurs and the Mongolians. So you must demonstrate that you have the capacity to be fair and just uh, to quote unquote minorities. So hence, you know, Alliance of democracy, for example, UN Human Rights Council, all these democratic countries should come together and speak out uh, for human rights and you know, against the repression of Tibetans and others by the Chinese government. You know? So there is in fact, you know, uh, alliance of democracy where many of the members of parliaments are coming together now uh, to counter uh, Chinese intrusion inroads uh, into the international community. So this is the only way. And one point is uh, the bilateral dialogue on human rights, right? So there were a lot of quote unquote Sinology, China experts say that, they said that before, like the Sinja, if you really want to bring changes with Chinese leadership, you must save their face. If you embarrass them publicly, they will never do anything. So you must take the human rights discourse from the public sphere in the streets and making statements by state department to a closed door discussion. I have visited so many European countries. Now, after 20 plus years of this bilateral dialogue on human rights, what they're saying is they are not getting appointments now <laughs> with the Chinese officials. To get an appointment is an achievement, right? Yeah. So now we must take it out in the street. I think the State Department should speak out, White House should speak out, all the countries should speak out, publish reports, you know, and that's how you make Chinese government accountable. So ultimately, Chinese leaders do care. The first thing the Chinese leaders do in the morning is not reach, you know, Xinhua News Agency and watch CCTV. First thing they will do is open BBC and CNN and New York Times and Washington Post. And that's a fact, right? So they do care what will what we'll say. I, I think you're absolutely right. The, the summits between President Bush and Hu Jintao often featured me or someone else handing a list of dissidents and the Chinese would uh, look at that and they would release some. That stopped happening about 13, 14 years ago. The quiet dialogue is not, is not, is not working. And um, our survey results, which we'll publish shortly, suggest there's much more support around the world, particularly in places like Japan, for, for stepping up uh, uh, statements and even pressure. How do you find, uh, beyond parliaments, how do you find uh, the correlation of international opinion on Tibet as you work with Europeans, Asian, North American audiences and governments? Yeah, I, I've been in my position for the, line, for the last nine years. The first six years was very tough. China had the money, they were making investments in all the country, you know, the wave of various capitals, wherever we go, mainly led by business people and economic interests, right? They want to, you know, uh, keep uh, Tibetan human rights at arm's length. In the last three years, there's a realization um, that, you know, uh, you know, doing business with China is also not profitable anymore. Uh, you know, so all the know-how, tech know-how, everything uh, Chinese government or Chinese uh, company have, you know, bought or stole and they are, they are put at fair disadvantage. So uh, I'm not surprised that many business uh, people in America are also uh, supporting strong actions on China on the issue of Tibet, Magninsky and other acts. Because they, the business people are the one who in the streets. They were the one who were advocating that let's do business with China. Let us make them rich and they will respect uh, human rights and then you know, liberal values and they will become like us. 
now, after so many decades, they realize that they are making more profit from us than we are making, you know, profit from uh, uh, them. Uh, so yes, in, in Japan too, uh, you know, in India also, you know, Japan and India were very quiet vis-a-vis uh, vis-a-vis uh, vis -vis China. Now I think the mainstream media and the politicians and think tanks all are coming out with reports after reports uh, on China, and they all want to take a stance, you know. So I think, which is a good thing because, you know, it dawned on them that finally that you have to protect your interests. Uh, you know, uh, that if you give in to Chinese government, they'll keep taking and not give you a concession. I have a lot of questions about um, your immediate neighborhood, um, mm -hmm. India, Nepal, Bhutan. Um, one person asks whether it's time for India to have more strategic clarity on the Tibet question and to move away from this somewhat ambiguous stance about the status of Tibet. Um, um, do you see that coming? Um, hopefully, you know, we've been saying for the last 60 years, whatever the Chinese government says you, you know, you must verify, 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 then trust, then only trust. <laughs> uh, so far, the Indian leaders have trusted first, beginning from Nehru all the way, you know, to recent years. Then it, when they realize that, you know, it is not what the Chinese government is doing, uh, then it's too late to verify, right? So this is what's happening. Now, mainstream media, you know, the think tanks and the army personnel and journalists, all are, Tibet is, you know, I think since 1960s, I think the largest discourse, the biggest discourse in the Indian media and in the intellectual circle has been uh, uh, Tibet. Uh, so, so, which is a good thing, actually, you know, the highest rating and highest interest. So there's uh, clearly major discourse. Um, now, whether the, it will lead to a changes in policy or not, uh, it is to be seen. Uh, but clearly, uh, now Indian leaders are also more realistic uh, than before. What about uh, Nepal and Bhutan? I would guess, tell me if I'm wrong, but I would guess that most people who live in Dharamsala today, they or their parents or their grandparents came through Nepal. Uh, or certainly many did, but not not anymore. Nepal is somewhat closed, and Nepal mm -hmm. signed on to the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, is Nepal going in a wrong direction as far as Tibetans are concerned? And what about Bhutan, which is not signing BRI? Um, you know, seems to be uh, resisting uh, Chinese hegemonic ambitions. How do you see the those two critical um, uh, uh, Buddhist uh, friends? Um, yes, I think the Tibetans came from Sikkim, Bhutan, Nepal, and Arunachal. Um, now, Bhutan has more aligned uh, you know, towards India, more closer with India. So Nepal used to be like that, but under enormous pressure uh, from the Chinese government, essentially, you know, Nepal has become a satellite state of China. I think the Chinese embassy in Nepal is more powerful than the U.S. embassy or, you know, even Indian embassy now. Uh, and then the present prime minister of Nepal also leaned more towards uh, uh, China. So as I said, in 1950s, Mao Zedong said, Tibet is the palm. Once we take over, we have to go after five fingers, you know, Nepal, Bhutan, Sikkim, Arunachal Pradesh, and Ladakh. So yes, they have already, they have made major inroads in Nepal, one finger. So they are trying. Uh, in Ladakh now, they're sending military personnel and occupying territories of uh, India. And in 2014 in Doklam, you know, they, they came, you know, close to Sikkim and they entered Bhutan. So, so the Chinese government policies, which they said in 1950s, are executed very efficiently. What uh, can you tell us? Uh, I, there's a question um... A somewhat technical question, but also, I suppose, a spiritual question. What would the role of the Central Tibet administration be in the um, selection of the next Dalai Lama? Is it completely uninvolved? Does it have some role? Um, yeah, we have. Yes, we will have some role because, you know, we represent and reflect the sentiments of the people. But this is a spiritual matter. And His Holiness Dalai Lama is the sole authority on his reincarnation. I mean, it makes sense. He is the Dalai Lama. And he should decide, you know, where and, you know, uh, when to be reborn, you know. Uh, so, 
Uh, and then recently in, uh, in November, October, November of last year, we had two major meetings of Tibetan community leaders from all over the world and Tibetan spiritual leaders from all over the world. Both the uh, meeting uh, decided that the reincarnation is a business of His Holiness Dalai Lama and it is for the Tibetan people. We invented this, you know, reincarnation concept. So we have a patent and a copyright over it, absolute patent. So yes, Chinese government, you know, can try to make duplicates, uh, uh, but duplicates are duplicates. So we are the original one. And yes, Tibetan people, Central Tibetan administration will have a role to play, but this is a spiritual matter and it's for the spiritual leaders to decide. We, we talked about this when you visited us, visited us at CSIS mm. uh, a little over a year ago. And, mm. and, and but we, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be interested in your views again. Um, Assuming uh, that China does um, apply Chinese law and announce its own successor uh, mm. to His Holiness, how do you think the Tibetan people res will respond to that? Well, you know, I mean, no one will accept that. Number one, um, a communist leader, a leader of Cuba uh, or North Korean leader, uh, appoints a Pope, uh, how many people, how many Catholics will actually follow that Pope, right? Mm -hmm. Similarly, when a Communist Party of China, you know, uh, tries to appoint the Dalai Lama, Tibetan people say, what the heck? You look at your track record. You destroyed 98% of monasteries and nunneries. You destroyed 99% of monks and nuns, right? Still, you sent thousands and thousands of Tibetan monks and nuns to prison. You tortured them. And as we speak, Larungar and Yashengar, the largest monastery and nunneries were demolition half. And, you know, so that's your track record. And how can we say a communist leader, a declared atheist organization, can say that we will select the religious leader and you should follow him, you know? And his Solonis jokingly said, if they're that serious, then first they must find the reincarnation of Mao Zedong, Teng Shopping, and Chao and Lai. And once they have the credential on reincarnation, perhaps they can interfere, you know? So throughout uh, history, they have demonstrated that they have utter disregard uh, for a religion and also utter disregard for His Holiness Dalai Lama. All the deal for the last 60 years is criticized His Holiness Dalai Lama. And finally they said, oh, we have interest and we will select the next Dalai Lama. So Tibetans will not at all uh, follow uh, the uh, Chinese uh, selected person. I, I, I imagine Karl Marx would be completely perplexed that, you know, 150 years plus after the Communist Manifesto, the largest communist state in the world is, is, is passing laws on religion. <laughs> Shows you how, how wrong he was, uh, Karl Marx, about religion. I have a very interesting question, which, which um, I hope you can answer. It's, it's a little uh, technical, um, but there are three um, Tibetan Buddhist republics within the Russian Federation, um, Ruyatia, mm -hmm. Tuva, and uh, Kaunkia. How do you engage with or, or reflect the views of or uh, interact with um, you know, Tibetan and Buddhist uh, mothers and sisters in those uh, parts of the Russian Federation? There's this Kalmyk and Buret and Tuva. Yeah. Interesting. When Tibet was independent, the Tibetan university, Tibetan monasteries were like the Nalanda University, you know, uh, 2000 years ago in India. So it was a center of civilization. So we had monks from Russia, Kalmyk monks and Buret and Tuba, they come to Tibet. The Mongolian monks came to Tibet and monks from India and Nepal and Bhutan and Ladakh and Sikkim all came to Tibet. Um, for the for wisdom, you know, and they all went back, and so they all follow, uh, uh, you know, uh, Buddhism and Tibetan Buddhism in particular. So yes, we have our uh, strong relationship. In fact, uh, the honorary representative of CTA and His Holiness Dalai Lama to Russia is a karmic lama. Uh, so he, you know, I appointed him. Uh, with the endorsement of His Holiness Dalai Lama. So he represents us in Russia. So we have very close relationship. And even now, they come to uh, Dharamsala uh, to seek His Holiness Dalai Lama's teaching every year. Uh, so the Mongo they are also of you know, Mongolian descent and uh, they're very passionate. Uh, in fact, you know, uh, 
sometimes when we have to seek a uh, blessing, uh, they do more jostling uh, than Tibetans to get close to His Holiness Dalai Lama. <laughs> I remember His Holiness told uh, some of us that um, he found that um, uh, Mongolia had the most passionate uh, Tibetan Buddhists. I spent last summer in Mongolia and you can yes. see it everywhere. You can see yes. in um, uh, Tibetan households, excuse me, Mongolian households, uh, pictures of His Holiness. But the geopolitics are very, very tricky for Mongolia. Um, are, are you able to engage with Ulaanbaatar um, about these issues? Yeah, not officially, you know. Uh, for example, uh, even though I was born and brought up in Darjeeling, which is very close to Nepal, and I've been to Nepal many times, I speak Nepali language. Since I was elected, I'm not allowed to, in fact, I was, I'm banned from entering Nepal. Uh, Mongolia also, a lot of people, you know, would like to see us and see me and I would like to visit, but given the close proximity um, and especially the, you know, railways for all the copper and all the minerals that they have to export has to go through China. So once his Solonet visited China, uh, his Solonet visited Mongolia, they shut down the railway network, right? And the price of copper uh, uh, increased in the international market. Uh, so that's in how, uh, what do you call, uh, punitive uh, the Chinese government is. So yes, there are a lot of Buddhists in Mongolia and I have, you know, some friends there too. But going there will make it, you know, very awkward and difficult for them. So I've never pressed uh, to go to Mongolia. And so, so, uh, so is with Taiwan, actually, you know. Um, I could go, uh, but then you don't want to put our friends in a very awkward uh, position, you know. So... Yeah, I try not to go. The Mongolians underneath the surface and the Taiwanese for that matter are, um, I would, I would uh, think even more passionate about His Holiness yes, in true. light of what's happening. I've told this story on webinars before, but my driver at one point in, in uh, Mongolia, when we were driving over some very bad roads, I asked him, why don't Mongolia join Belt and Road and get mm. good infrastructure? And he was quiet for a moment. And then he said, Mongolians would rather have books than bridges. <laughs> yes. So you know that um, they appreciate your concern for their uh, safety uh, and mm -hmm. uh, ability to resist Chinese pressure. But underneath the surface, my sense is there's very, very broad and deep support. If His Holiness ever went to Mongolia or uh, Taiwan, yes, there would yes. be an enormous outpouring, no doubt about it. Let me ask you, how are, uh, I think you're in Delhi now, but how are people in the in the Tibetan community and in Dharamsala and and and, and within, um, you know, uh, uh, China itself, how are they faring um, with COVID nineteen? Yes, you know, we should never forget that it's Wuhan origin virus which has created really a, a, a chaos, a havoc, right? Economy, downturn, and unemployment everywhere, and it will take years to recover uh, from it. And as far as Tibet is concerned, uh, Chinese government came out with a report saying 106 Tibetans were infected and no one died. And we know for a fact that just from one, count, one county, at least a dozen died, right? So since March 18th, not even a single report on, you know, uh, the coronavirus pandemic in Tibet. Now in exile, we have done the best we can, learning lessons from what's going on around the world. We have four-pronged strategy. So we have kept all the Tibetan settlements very safe. Anyone who comes from outside, we have set up a community centers and we have to uh, put them in quarantine 14 days. You do the tests. If you're negative, then only you can go to your family members. And we provide Tibetan medicine as an immunity booster, which is very popular, seems to, uh, you know, uh, making some impact and in a lot of Tibetans are uh, uh, taking it. And then we also have, you know, modern mental health counseling you can call 911 type and get counseling. And we have also spiritual counseling. And we have prayers every evening. So they know because it's pandemic, the mental stress um, has been enormous. So we are trying to, to help them through prayers, uh, through counseling and Tibetan medicine and you know, uh, quarantine centers. So, so far we have you know, lessened the damage uh, to a minimum. Um, I'm, my understanding is that your name, Lobsang Sangche, in Tibetan means kind-hearted lion. Um, I think that came through today um, very well. Um, as the Sikyong, uh, as the head of the CTA, you've um, 
you've helped us understand uh, much, much better um, all the you know, really intriguing and important aspects of the future of Tibet for the United States and for the world um, in geopolitical terms, in terms of the environment and water, in terms of spirituality and um, this growing competition with China. And I think your, your um, talk today, I hope, will give some really um, good ideas for the people who are quietly preparing to um, govern our country after January, no matter who wins. I hope they take on board your really wise words for what the U.S. needs to do for our own national interests and our own values. Thank you once again for joining us. And thank you all for joining us uh, on, on the webinar today. Thank you. Mike.